magnetic materials respond to magnetizing fields in different ways. And here's here's a, um, a useful useful link. I I, I think it's a uh, has uh, several links within it. Uh, it's for the Institute of Rock Magnetism at the University of Minnesota. And it, it covers some basic uh, basic ideas and points out some distinctions that we probably haven't emphasized enough, and that is that units that we're using, which are the CGS units, uh, come from a formulation that uses these fictitious, fictitious mag magnetic poles. And that's the way we've been working with it. Now, if we were working with it from a uh, current uh, current loop, point of view, then we would be thinking about or using standard international units. And, and um, so in our case, we're using CGS units. And the, and the origin really kind of comes back to uh, the, the fact that we're, we're formulating the fields in terms of these fictitious magnetic poles, which we know don't exist, but that doesn't keep us from using them anyway. Um, so I think uh, you know the di different different classes of magnetic materials uh, that you run into. The different ways that magnetic materials respond has something to do has a lot to do with uh, the distribution of electrons uh, in those elements. And if all the electron shells are filled, uh, all the electrons are going to be paired. They're going to be spinning in opposite directions. There won't be any net magnetic uh, field. But if you bring a magnet close to such an object, then that object responds according to Lentz's law uh, by generating an opposing um, magnetic field, a, a uh, magnetic field that opposes the inducing field. So this gives us a negative susceptibility, and this is uh, very characteristic of diamag diamagnetic materials. The susceptibilities are very, very small. And here's just another example of that. We've got a magnet here with a flat side and a pointy side. And the magnetic field intensity, the flux density over here is larger. So the magnetic field intensity is larger. If we put a diamagnetic piece of diamagnetic, diamagnetic material in this field, it will be repulsed from the stronger magnetic field. So it will swing to the left a very little bit, a very tiny bit. And uh, this, this, this uh, uh, slight uh, repelling action is really characteristic of the diamag diamagnetic materials. And examples uh, include quartz with a susceptibility of 0.5 times 10 to the minus 6 CGS units. Calcite, halite, these are really small. If you take a look at magnetite, for example, the susceptibilities are going to be 10 to the 6th, order of 10 to the 6th times uh, this susceptibility. So it's a very small susceptibility. Now when we get to paramagnetic materials, they have their shells almost filled. There will um, there'd be an odd number of electrons. So they, they have a positive, uh, the, the, the odd number of electron, the, the odd electron, will align its dipole moment with that of the magnetizing field so that it produces an attractive force towards the stronger uh, of the two poles here. So we have positive uh, magnetic susceptibilities. And again, this is on a relative scale here. When we start comparing it to the uh, susceptibilities of ferromagnetic uh, materials and ferromagnetic materials, these these are very very small, and um, you know these paramagnetic uh, paramagnetic uh, anomalies associated with varying amounts of iron and mag manganese oxides uh, can produce significant anomalies. You know, on the order of 25 nanoteslas. But the difference between paramagnetic and diamagnetic is the difference between a attractive and opposing, positive and negative. Um, Susceptibility. So, again, just some examples uh, in terms of scale diamagnetic materials minus these are negative susceptibilities, very small. 
and uh, the paramagnetic susceptibilities uh, positive, also very small, but much, much larger in an absolute sense than, um, <clears throat> you know, about 70 times uh, as large to 320 times as large here. So, uh, so paramagnetic mineral minerals generally have an odd number, odd number of electrons. Uh, atomic moments generally tend to align with the polarizing field. And the paramagnetic susceptibility is much, much larger than, I should put it, absolute values here uh, than the diamagnetic susceptibilities. So the kind of magnetism that we're most familiar with, the magnets that are hanging on your wall or your refrigerator, that you have notes uh, that are pinned to your wall, these are ferromagnetic materials, iron, nickel, cobalt. And the domains generally are randomly oriented um, and, and might not exhibit any net magnetic field. Uh, but when we subject these ferromagnetic materials to a magnetizing field, just remember back to the hysteresis uh, loop, hysteresis loop that we talked about earlier on. Uh, and let's just flip over to this diagram here. Uh, another useful site that you might want to visit. But I just, you know, here we're just going to pause briefly and look at the hysteresis curve. If we start off at zero, we have a magnetizing field, the strength of magnetization plotted on the y-axis. The strength, the, the magnetization will, will increase up to some saturation value, in which case these, we usually think of magnetic materials as being, as consisting of a lot of little magnetic domains, and uh, in which the net dipole moment uh, of all the atoms of, are oriented in, in the same direction. So at saturation, we get all these little domains um, oriented in the same same direction. Now when we pull back on the intensity of the magnetizing field, we end up with some remnant uh, magnetization. It will retain uh, magnetization after coming up to saturation. So if we're looking at all the little domains in the uh, <clears throat> ferromagnetic object at saturation, they're all going to be aligned. They're all the magnetic dipole moments are going to be pointing in the same direction. And, um, and after the field is withdrawn, a, a significant fraction of those domains are going to remain aligned. So ferromagnetic uh, materials are probably the most common geological materials, the ones that we would be interested in and be we'd be looking at the effect of the ferromagnetic materials most often. That would be materials like magnetite, ilmenite, and so on. And in ferromagnetic materials, you tend to have magnetic domains that uh, have dipole moments preferentially in one direction, uh, a greater number of dipole moments uh, preferentially aligned in one direction than in the other. But you do have kind of, you, you, you do have uh, opposing camps of uh, dipole moments uh, that, that tend to counteract, uh, tend, to, tend to work against each other. So, and reduce the, uh, the, the net dipole moment. Um, so, there's another aspect to this relationship between the intensity of magnetization and the intensity of the magnetizing field. Over here, we just have a straight linearity with the uh, susceptibility, but uh, for these ferromagnetic um, materials, uh, we have a denominator, uh, 1 plus eta times the susceptibility. And this is referred to as a demagnetization factor. It tends to reduce the intensity of magnetization de depending on the uh, uh, magnitude of this uh, uh, demagnetization factor, which is shape dependent. And it tends to be zero or nearly zero, so almost no effect for long needle-like objects, but up to four pi for spherically shaped uh, objects. And, and this kind of magnetization uh, of these ferromagnetic materials uh, is something that is retained once those materials are brought down below their Curie temperature, as we know. And here are just some, um, uh, here's a 
table and here's a plot uh, just to give you kind of a relative sense of susceptibilities that we've been talking about. Now remember the uh, diamagnetic materials we were talking about 0.25 times 10 to the minus 6 so magnetite is on the order of 0.3 times 10 to the minus 6 or times 10, 10 to the uh, times 10 to the 10 to the 6 CGS units. It would be 0.3 CGS units, and this is 0.3 times 10 to the 6th, and so on. So they tend to be much, much, much larger than diamagnetic or paramagnetic materials. And as you can see here, the three most prominent ones, the ones we mentioned already, magnetite, pyrotite, and ilmenite. Uh, but certainly others in here, franklinite, dolomite, uh, with, with very small susceptibilities, granite, um, one of the more acidic uh, igneous rocks, 28 to 2700. Uh, Gabbro, a more basic uh, igneous rocks, and, and so on. So these are perhaps a useful table. We're interested in the CGS units. These would be standard international ersteds. Uh, so this is an informative plot here because you can see them in a relative sense plotted with the basic igneous rocks. Uh, having the, the larger magnetic susceptibilities with the uh, more acidic igneous rocks, something like uh, granite, kind of having wide ranges but tending to average um, around 647 metamorphic rocks, 349. And then we get to the sedimentary rocks here, which are, have uh, very low susceptibilities. Antiferromagnetic materials are a special class where the magnetic domains, there are an equal number of magnetic domains pointing in one direction, uh, matched by the number of magnetic domains that are pointing in the opposite direction. So we tend to have a net zero uh, dipole moment, and uh, hematite, hydrous oxides of hilmonite are antiferromagnetic. So just in conclusion, the ferromagnetic materials are of greatest interest to us. Um, these, as we pointed out in the previous table, uh, a lot of the igneous rocks, uh, very varying amounts of magnetite, and uh, uh, these these uh, ferromagnetic uh, minerals, magnetite, uh, pyrotite, ilmenite, and uh, they're the features that can be mapped regionally, and. Um, and they, they can lead to anomalies that are several hundred nanoteslas. And as, as we talked about earlier on when we were you know, just starting our discussions about uh, magnetics, the uh, crustal magnetic anomalies that we saw are on the order of you know, plus or minus 400 nanoteslas. And you can see here looking at, uh, now I just bring, this is, goes back a ways to the early days of uh, just trying to figure out what was going on, the birth of plate tectonics. and. Uh, some of the early surveys across uh, ocean ridges, you can see the variation in uh, magnetic field intensity here, at minus 500 to 500 nanoteslas. So these are the kinds of anomalies that are being produced by these uh, ferromagnetic, uh, ferromagnetic materials. So um, next time we're going to start talking about simple geometrical objects in uh, interpretation of magnetic anomalies. We'll start off with the horizontal cylinder. We'll also look at Poisson's relationship uh, between, which establishes a relationship between the gravitational field of an object and the magnetic field. So hope to see you next time. Thanks for joining us.